All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 24th day of December. For some people, Christmas Eve. Not to, so for, to, for some Christians, Christmas Eve. For others, not. Uh, in the year of our Lord, 2023. Yes, the Orthodox is it January 6th, 7th. For the uh, many of the Orthodox. I suggest all Christians move, move our celebration of Christmas to January the 7th. Uh, then we can just leave uh, the, the winter solstice to the pagans because it's been commercialized. They can do their Santa Claus and their Christmas trees and their gifts and their garbage that all distract from Christ on that, and we can set apart the seventh for Christ. Just a suggestion. I doubt if, if the world is going to listen to me, the Christian world, but if enough of us Personally, we can do it, and that's the important thing. Personally, we could do that. We could say, we're, as a family, we're not going to do it on the 25th. We'll do it on the 7th. It has to do with the calendar change. The uh, The Orthodox didn't go with uh, Pope Gregory's calendar. Not that the calendar didn't need to be corrected, but... It was the leap year thing. 365 days is not accurate enough. Otherwise, your 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 year slowly drifts around the your your months and days all drift around the year, <clears throat> which they do in Islam, by the way. Islam, uh, the the Jewish calendar ha has a solar as uh, is, is a lunar calendar with a solar correction. Uh, it actually comes out, I think. Uh, like seven out of 19 years actually have 13 months. So every so often, originally it was based on observation, now it's calculated. But So every every few years there's a, a longer year, one month longer, in order to re, to snap the calendar back to... So your, your spring festivals don't end up in the fall. But Christmas is a problem. The commercialization of Christmas. We've let the world do this. We need to stop doing this. We need to to um, exercise a much more public Christianity. Maybe this will be a series of videos on that. Public, exercising our Christianity in a public way, a responsible, biblically appropriate public way, not con not constrained by the the nonsense of this world. So what does Jesus tell us? Let's always start with him. Um, nope, wrong button. Where am I? Right button. There, there we go. Right button. <clears throat> Matthew five fourteen. You know, accordance. They have a defect in this program. You can't turn off the red letters. Red on white is not a good screen, or is you know the the black on white is much better. These people out there, they, they put like red letters on blue, uh, y yellow backgrounds, all kinds of terrible things. It's one thing that when I uh, educated myself uh, for printing, because I had a printing ministry, I learned all kinds, you know, yeah, there's a whole lot of stuff about color science and, and trial and error, too. You learn that certain things just don't work well. You need contrast. Red is not good, uh, especially that color red. If it's going to be red, it should be like a dark. Nor are the l colors of the letters inspired. You know, red-letter Christians, they have a defective Christianity. And we need to expose that kind of stuff. <clears throat> That's what I'm going to talk about today. How to be the light of the world. 
or some suggestions on it. But let's go with, with what our Lord told us here. Matthew 5, 14, you are the light of the world, talking to his disciples, not the people in general, of course. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Yes, indeed. <clears throat> you know, I've been criticizing the uh, the theonomists and the theocrats because they want to use law. They want to use force. Law is compulsive. They want to use force. God doesn't want to do that. Uh, the new covenant is a covenant of the heart. It is willingly doing the will of God. It is not compulsive. It is not ugly. It's not Calvinist. Uh I just have to get a dig in on them because they need to be publicly shamed. So what I want to talk about is public public encouragement and public shaming, being the light in the world, in the world. And we've been t lectured a lot about that from various sides. I want to consider a proper way to do it. In some way that uh, some people aren't going to like, but I don't care what they think. In fact, I, well, actually, I do care what they think. We just need to adjust their thinking. Um, it's like Black Lives Matter. Was Black Lives Matter all wrong? No. No. They need to be corrected. Um, is, are the cons is, is, is the followers of Trump all wrong? No. They need to be corrected. There's a lot of things in this world that there's... Okay, let, let me point this out. So you, you have a, a, a conservative movement in the United States. If we're sort of divided between conservatives and progressives. And I think the prog progressive is probably the best label to put on the other side. Conservatives at, conservatism at its best tries to conserve what is good and proper and constructive. Progressivism at its best tries to progress to what is good and and solid and constructive. Progress from what is bad to what is good. And conservative tri conservatism tries to hold on to what is good. Together they work well. <laughs> If you if you take the best of conservat the idea of conservatism conserving what is good, and you a progressive moving from the what is not good to what is good, you end up with, with everything being good. So that's so. But the problem is inconsistencies. So conserving capitalism is not good. Capitalism as a economic theory that says greed is good. Adam Smith. Adam Smith is bad. It, it may work for some people, but that doesn't make it good. Is it good for society, unrestrained capitalism? No, it's destructive. It's ter terribly destructive. Unrestrained capitalism in Europe, like in England, resulted in Marxism. It was a reaction against unrestrained capitalism. Unrestrained greed, the, the the exploitation of workers and everything else, it's that's bad. It's not treating people. You know, you are to love one another. We are to do unto others as we would have others do unto us. And Jesus said, "That's the law and the prophets." There are universal Christian values that apply to everybody. They're not just Christian values, they are universal values, because they're all rooted in the one God. <laughs> there is only one God. And uh, people have different degrees of understanding him, some very poorly and some better. But I think being a public Christian, that's what Jesus is talking about, let your 
you are the light of the world. That, that is a fact. That's what Christians are. Christ dwells in us, born-again Christians. We are the light of the world. There is no other light in the world. We are the light of the world. We are the visible presence of God in the world. We're not being, doing a very good job of it. Well, we're clothed in this flesh, and that doesn't help, but that's there's a reason for that. But the glory may be of God and not of us, because we don't deserve the glory. Uh, but as Jesus says here, you know, do not... You don't light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. It, and it gives light to all who are in the house. That's what we need to do. Not hide away in fear. We need to act as Christians, walk as Christians in the world. Not trying to impose our will, just educating them <laughs> in what is right and wrong. How do, you, how do you do that? Well, how does a child, how you educate a child? Uh, well, there's basically, there's, there's reward and punishment. Um, there's some, sometimes you shame them. There used to be, that used to be done in public schools. I suppose they don't do that anymore. You had an unruly child, and uh, somebody that's just looking for attention or something. What you do? Sometimes it doesn't work. There is two ways to shame people in public school, in grade school: make them stand in the corner. And if that didn't work, because say they were just looking for attention, and uh, and they weren't particularly uh, affected by, since they're just looking for attention anyway, giving them attention by standing them in the corner so everybody's watching them doesn't really help. So then you send them to the principal's office, and it was always terrifying to be sent to the principal's office. Uh, you can tell I'm speaking from a, a experience here that some kids probably never got st <laughs> had to stand in the corner. Um. So some of these things don't necessarily work with all individuals, but the principal's office, what that was, that was the secondary step. Why you did that was because you got the, the uh, disturbance out of the classroom. And it was, and the, the, what do they do at the principal's office? They just sit, sit there until class is over or until for a certain period of time, and, and then you can go back. It was just, you never got past the secretary. I mean, it was just a, um, a holding area <laughs> For the teacher's convenience, it it didn't really. It just took you out of the room, so you didn't, you you couldn't disrupt the class and do whatever you were trying to do. Who knows why people do those things? I don't want to analyze myself. All right, so, but how do we? But what I'm why I mention that is there it used to used to be a value of public shaming. It's a very Christian thing to do. Shunning. Uh, the Amish do it, but they don't do it well. The Amish is like, well, really, what they try to do is enforce born-again Christian Christianity on people that aren't born again, and that doesn't work. It doesn't work. You cannot legislate true morality because true morality has to come from Christ and comes from the heart. And Christ has to convert us. But in this world, we are the light of the world, and how we react to things should correspond to God's view on things in a constructive way, not in an oppressive way, in a constructive way. So on, say on YouTube, you've got the thumbs up and the thumbs down. Well, they they took the thumbs down count off. That was foolish because well, they they they're going the way of the world. But we need to we need to recognize in things like progressive movements uh, when they when they correspond to the will of God, we ought to reward them. Thumbs up or praise or whatever and show us show them why we're praising them and how what they're doing corresponds with the will of God. 
And when they're doing what's not corresponding to the will of God, we should give them a little thumbs down and then explain, educate them why what they're doing is not actually progressive and for the good, too. Um, and same thing with conservatives. When they're wrong, we should uh, shame them that or, or educate them, which would be the first step. Object, give them a little thumbs down and say, no, you're wrong, and this is why you're wrong. And if you really want to be a conservative and conserve what is good, and then you have to be born again to really do a good job of it, you know, you know get the gospel in there someplace. But we should all be going through life doing, be in the light of the world, exposing darkness, illuminating darkness, and... Uh, so, so people reflecting the Christ. Christ did both. He was merciful and compassionate, and he would eat uh, with sinners, serious sinners, prostitutes, and tax collectors. So he would he would get down with the very bottom of the barrel and have lunch with them. Talk to them, teach them, talk about God's will for them and salvation and bring them to the light and to the liberty that, that's in Christ. And with Pharisees, he would eviscerate them verbally. He would, no mercy verbally, but it's still out of love. Everything that Christ did was out of love including eviscerating, verbally eviscerating the Pharisees in hopes that they would repent. Not many did, but some did. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. So there were some. And, of course, Paul was a Pharisee. Jesus sort of arrested him on the road, <laughs> literally arrested him. Okay, so how do we should do these things rather than than being uh, uh, social media? This is uh, or or in public. Okay, say you go to the grocery store, go to Walmart, and here's this guy, this say. 30-ish guy, uh, skinny with obviously hairy legs. And they're obviously, he has hairy legs because he's wearing a women's cotton summer dress. What should their reaction be to that? Should we simply ignore it? Well, that's one way to deal with it. Um, uh, if you want to go beyond that, well, there's a a point that's depending on how appropriate it is it, it can go as far as shaming it should you should you know scowl at him or like but some people are just do that obviously for attention i mean some of the people i see that the the trans who knows if they're really what they're really doing people do all kinds of things for all kinds of motives I think, uh, like, the transgender stuff, I think it's more of a fad than anything else. Um, because, obviously, when you look in the mirror, your gender is pretty obvious. <laughs> Unless you have some genetic defect, which is very rare. It's, it's, it's pretty obvious what you are, physically. And if you have a problem with that, Why? Ingratitude. There's there's a sinful issue going on there, but I think there's some people that that it's just the in thing to do, and they're just going with the with the crowd. It's just like when I was younger, it was the uh, in the '60s, uh, and well in, in the early '70s to a lesser degree, it was rebellion. The '60s, the youth movement, the hippies, the uh, rock and roll, you know, the uh, drugs. Uh, Sex, all that stuff, rebelling, rebelling, rebelling. That was all about uh, what was going on. 
uh, rebelling against society, rebelling against your parents. It was just, just the movement. It was just what was the hip thing to do. And if you didn't conform to that, you were you were outside. So, but there was a lot of that, and people just you know what's going on the college campuses. It's youth culture. They're being and they're and they're they're just going along with the, the with everybody else. I mean, there's way too much of this gender confusion to be natural. It's, no, no, this is not normal. This is not this is not human society. It, it, it's not gender is not simply a social construct. Look in the mirror. What kind of weird idea of biology do you have? Do you think it's a social construct? And the older you'll get, the more you'll realize that men and women are actually wired differently, too, in our brains. And our, our, our function is part of God's creative order, and it becomes manifest. We wreck it, people, especially if you understand that, that God created us and he created man— male and female. Together we're Adam, in fact. Um, and it's, we're not, not good to be alone. We're supposed to be. Marriage is the normal thing. Catholics, your priests, why do they have so much sexual problems? Because they're in an unnatural state. That's part of it. And you silly conservatives that, that don't want to eliminate that problem, you're, you're out of your minds. You're not thinking biblically. You're not looking to what God says. You're trying to hold on to tradition that isn't even that old. You don't understand where it came from either. Like, like the, the so-called pope with the keys of Peter. You have no understanding of where the very idea of secession came from historically, how it developed, and how it's not rooted in the scriptures, but it came about step by step by step, and you don't know the path it followed, because you don't know. You, you, just, you just listen to your priests, and they've been educated in, in nonsense. Go back and read the early church fathers. You can see how these things developed how the, the emphasis changed in Christianity, how the, the uh, emphasis on, on uh, the sacraments developed over time. That's not part of the New Testament. They're there in the New Testament, but the emphasis isn't on that. Change in emphasis is also uh, a, a, a change in the very character of something. So if you don't understand these things, well, you, you try to hold on to something because it was that way in the 1950s or in the 1850s. If you go back to 1850, though, you're before Vatican I, and the things are different then. Yeah, and the, this, all the church never changes. Really? You mean the, the spiritual church that is the true church of Jesus Christ never changes? Yes, but these visible things are not the true church. No, the true church is all those who belong to Christ. And I can show you that in your own catechism. But because they hold on to all kinds of different things that are contradictory, there's all kinds of confusion. The more tradition you bring in, the more confused things get. And Christians, part of being a public Christian, part of being the light of the world, light is public, okay? You can't be, as Jesus said, you don't put your light under a basket. You put it on a lampstand. So you act as a Christian in the world, in your life, daily. So you go to the store and somebody is, is dressed up to get attention. You don't give them a thumbs up. You could publicly give them a thumbs down. But you don't want to go too far with that. All you got to do is indicate disapproval. Or you could even ask, why? Why are you doing that? You want attention or <laughs> expose the truth? 
Let the Holy Spirit guide you. But we don't want to give them approval. You don't give approval to what is bad behavior. Um, and, and again, I, ideally, the, you know, look to the Holy Spirit to give you wisdom in some of that stuff. Sometimes it's just shaking your head and walking away. It's, I, I, I can't not do that. It's just like, or I'll look at somebody else and shake my head. Sort of like indicate that. Uh, which is good because public shaming is a virtue if done out of love, done out of love. I don't hate people that do that. I realize there's something wrong. There, it's, it's sinful and, uh, you know, that there's multiple reasons why they could do it. It's, it's not necessarily, well, it's, it's sinful one way or the other, but sin should never be thumbs up should always be discouraged publicly you know the light shows it for what it is and we're we are the light of the world whether we like it or not uh, unless you want to be darkness and 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 hide this hide the stuff no light exposes exposes evil uh, evil doesn't come to the light either because it flees from the light because it is darkness it can't it can't overcome the light Darkness can't. Darkness is a negative. Darkness is a, a lack of goodness. Darkness has no power. Darkness can never overcome light because it's just simply the absence of light. The same as the same as sin. The same as evil. It's it's not a positive thing. It doesn't have a real existence. As, as if there is a real substance that's called evil. What it is in us is a lack. See, we're born sinful. What that is is not a, we're not, it is not a positive evil thing in us. It is a lack of the presence of God. It is a lack of the Spirit of God in us. We're born without the presence of God in us. And because we are a self, an individual that has a, a um, awareness of ourself. See, we can't have a relationship with God unless we we have a self and we're self-aware. Uh, we're, we're not just a, that's part of being a rational being. You you recognize that you have an existence, and you can contemplate yourself, reflect on yourself. We have to have that. That's a good thing. We can't have a relationship with God unless we, we have a consciousness of our own self and a consciousness of him and a consciousness of the two in relation. God can't have a relationship with us without that. We can't have a relationship with him. A part of being in his image is that because God has contemplates himself too. He's self-aware, obviously. Animals don't have that. They can't contemplate themselves. That they they react, they interact, they have um, instincts. They they can learn. They can do lots of things, but they they do not have a, a self consciousness like a human being does. They can't relate. They relate to us in the way animals relate to each other. They can't relate to us uh, as human beings, or they can't relate to God. Uh, consciously. Only human beings, as far as uh, beings, uh, uh, not uh, putting angels out of the picture for a moment here, only human beings can do that because we're designed for a relationship with God. And without God in us, though, all we are is our self. So we are self-centered because there's nothing to balance us out. We That, self, that, that self-awareness is necessary for it's good, but without God, it's not good. It's the absence of God that, that where the evil comes from. It is evil because of the absence of God. It's a missing part. We are incomplete. So that's the, and that's the problem. And where the light of God is not, there's no goodness. See, God is the light. Without his light in us, we cannot do good. We're not designed. We're 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 dependent. We're utterly dependent on him. 
We are not autonomous. We're not self-existing. We cannot say, I am that I am. Only God can say that. And it's with that broken relationship, that's where we're not born with imputed guilt and the other garbage these theologians teach. They are so ignorant. They're biblically ignorant. You just look at what the Bible teaches and think about it. Look to God for understanding. He'll, re he'll give you understanding. There's things that we can't really understand. We might get a glimpse of it, but... But like that, I mean, it's, 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 this, is com this should be like common sense. Even Augustine talked about that, I believe, about the, the, the uh, sin being the, the lack of the presence of God. Not that I'm a student of Augustine. I read some of his stuff and dismissed it. Both, it's not all bad. It's like Aquinas isn't all bad, but not good either. So if we are, we are indeed the light of the world, we, as Christians, if we're born-again Christians, we are the light. God is present in us. His light is in us. And we should put that on a lampstand. We should make it visible to the world. How we, how we act, how we live, how we dress. Doesn't mean we dress like Amish. But what it means is we dress conservatively. We dress, women dress modestly. Men dress modestly. We don't, women don't go around seeing how much flesh they can expose. We, transcend, we, we avoid silly trends like the holy genes. It's like, really? You're paying extra money for those? From what I understand, it's hard for women to buy pants that aren't pre-mutilated. You know, a little battery acid will do that. The only problem is the holes will appear in public somewhere. Battery acid, sulfuric acid, what it does, it, it takes the cellulose and the fibers and converts it into sugar. And sugar, of course, is soluble. So it breaks the chains. And uh, which means you can turn fiber into fuel for your car, too. <clears throat> but it's... Uh, but anyway, so if you, like, you accidentally get some battery acids. We, we used to have to add acid to our batteries years ago. Now, now they're sealed and you don't do that. But, yeah, so you'd have to, it was diluted. But if you got some on you, you wouldn't know it. And then all of a sudden, you'd, there would be a hole in your chains. <laughs> it would just appear there. Or after they were washed, the sugar would just wash away. You have a hole. And they charge extra for that? It was embarrassing, you know? Uh, why, why do you do that? That's this foolishness of this world. So it's like women don't do that. Christian women shouldn't do that stuff. They, they shouldn't participate in the foolishness of the world. Uh, this is simply being the light of the world. When I had the Christian bookstore, I remember one one mother and her daughter. Maybe they just came back from playing tennis or something, but they came into the bookstore with short shorts and halter tops, and again, maybe it was just because they were playing tennis. But it's like you're walking into a Christian bookstore dressed like that. It wasn't really appropriate for public. I mean, that Christians shouldn't. You know, women should not see how much flesh they could expose. That's that's of the world. The the dress standards for Christianity, both men and women, is modesty. Modesty. If we dress like the world, we're not being the light of Christ. I don't want to make a law out of this stuff, a burden out of it. But we should we should strive to live as the light of the world, uh, and live according to God's standards, and. In a sexual way, as as not not to uh, as to be loved because we love the world, and because we we need to demonstrate uh, show forth a standard of godliness, not Phariseeism. There's way too much of that. It's like fundamental Baptists; they don't know how to it's a, every turn everything into a law. No, that's not God's way. It's out of love. It's, it's out of respect for yourself and for others. 
it's it's like the way women dress. Women, why why do you want to show so much of your flesh? Because you want attention from men. Ungodly attention. That's why women are to dress modestly, so you don't arouse lust in others. A lust for women that, if you want to do that with your husband, that's fine. In your house. <laughs> Just don't read Augustine, because he's toxic. Because that's the place for sexual desire. And you can rejoice in sexual desire in a proper context, in marriage. Because God gave it as a gift. It's not only for procreation. That's just a secondary thing. It's for the, the union, the intimate union, union of husband and wife that is supposed to reflect the relationship between Christ and his church. And we should... Especially like a social media, there's so many opportunities for that. Reward what is good and punish what is bad. Uh, encourage what is good and shun or discourage what is bad, depending on how it, bad it is, you know. Especially if, if people, uh, if they don't take to correction, well, then you may have to go a step farther, like s strong <laughs> correction. But it doesn't. You don't need to do that right off the bat because that that simply just produces a reaction. But for, at first, you know, it's like with like disciplining a child. First thing you do is you try to explain why it's wrong. You don't spank a child, for example. You don't resort to physical punishment if, except if it's a repeated dangerous circumstance. For example, they're doing something that endangers them. And they have to be strongly disciplined uh, in order to protect their lives, their safety. You have to make an impression. Uh, but the, you don't start there. You start with, don't play in the street. You could get hurt. But children tend to simply forget things like that. They're, they're, not, they're not thinking like that. They're out playing, and their focus is on that. And they have this little, little circle around them that there's their world. And so sometimes parents have to have to to physically discipline them in order to create enough of a impression that they realize bad things happen if I do that. It is so serious that I got spanked. In other words, that's that's a serious thing. So I, I don't want to get spanked, so I'm not going to do that. That that is love. That is discipline that's done out of love. Now some people don't do it out of love. But as the Proverbs say, the, the, the man that spares the rod hateth his son. And that's what it's referring to, that you, you simply don't bother to discipline your children for their own good because it's, it's like you see this in the store all the time. The grocery store, parent, kids are going screaming and hollering and their parents just ignore them. They don't care. They don't care about the people around them. They don't care about their children. They're not willing to discipline their children. My mother used to have a technique for disciplining our, us when we went to the store. We were just incorrigible. She had a technique. That she would grab us by the ear, but she would sort of roll the ear between her fingers in order to cause more pain. And then, then you it was like a submission hold. <laughs> then you walked out of the store with her. <laughs> because she had more than one child. So... Be like, like me and my brother that would be at the, like at the store with her. Uh, that was when we were pretty small because kids kept coming, and we'd be called one on one side, one on the other. Ah! <laughs> she didn't want to make a big public display, so it was like, eh. but she knew how to handle the situation. More than one time, uh, the shopping trip was interrupted to take us home. So it's it's something you just do. You don't just simply ignore the problem. You deal with it. 
And we are the only ones who are the light of the world. So in this public situation, for example, what's, what, do we have this atrocious situation in our government right now with, uh, and what's going on in Israel? Apparently, the Israeli government has purchased the Congress and the White House. They probably got, they're probably blackmailing Biden and others. You got the Epstein thing. You know, did you know there, that, there was, that Epstein was probably connected with the Mossad? So why would, I, I had to explain this to my wife the other day. She said, well, well why, why would they do that? To, to blackmail them, to control them. Why would you uh, why would you set up an uh, an island and populate it with fourteen year old girls and then give fr people important people free transportation down there? Well, when I was in the Air Force, we were warned against things like that, being compromised and blackmailed. That's what you do. See, this country is not Russian interference in American elections; it's Israeli interference in American elections. They own the Congress. APAC boasts about owning the Congress. You think the Congress is going to investigate foreign influence in the Congress? Why do you think they tried to accuse Russia, uh, uh, Trump of Russia collusion? Because they knew the Russians weren't uh, involved. They knew that Russia had no real influence. I mean, buying some ads on Facebook or something is not interference in an election. Buying congressmen is. So as Christians, how do we respond to that? Well, shame them. I mean, this is serious. And, you know, the, 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 the people like the squad, the four, the squad, they were one of the few, there was a handful of uh, in Congress that were opposing what the genocide in Gaza. I mean, this is in-your-face genocide. The Israelis are out of their minds. This, they'll, they'll end up destroying themselves through what they're doing. They are the in-your-face war crimes, ethnic cleansing and genocide. There's, there's no doubts about this. And it's not defensive at all. And perhaps half the casualties that happened on the 7th of October was inflicted by the Israeli military in their panic and using air, American gunships on civilian vehicles just shooting anything that moved down the road. Tanks shooting into houses. So there'd be somebody in the house maybe shooting an AK at the Israeli military and they put a tank shell into an Israeli house. And, of course, there was Israeli civilians in the house. Who killed him? The Israelis. Indiscriminate. They even have a doctrine to, ki to kill Israelis rather than let them be taken hostage. Why was Hamas taking hostages? Because Israel has tens of thousands of political prisoners. They wanted them to, to, for exchange. And our government is partners in genocide. The Congress is partners in it. Biden is partners in it. Do you think they'd be doing, and this is public, in-your-face genocide, and the United States is blocking the U.N. from doing anything about it? What are we supposed to do as Christians? Shame them! And those in Congress, including the squad that stands up against it, praise them for that and explain to them why it's good and what progressives ought to be doing. That if they want to expo exposing their own party, and we should go and say to the to the to the Democrats, the le the progressives, the left, why are you putting up this neocon warmonger? as candidate, again, for president. And Trump supporters, why are you supporting an egomaniac that is so self-centered he can't possibly make America good? Because he's not good. 
what values are he is actually espousing? He's not the light of the world. What does he build? Golf courses and, and motels and casinos for the rich and famous. Hotels and casinos for the rich and famous. Is that productive? Is that what we want? An America built, filled with that kind of garbage? We need to stand for Christian values, real Christian values, in a Christian way. Not an oppressive way, but rooted in love. And not being silent about these things, but live as the light in the, in the public world. The light of the world. And we should do it consciously. You know, I, I noticed, and sometimes I just don't feel like doing it, but I just like say so I go to get the groceries. You know, it's amazing if you're just walking down the aisle and you smile at someone and say, God bless you. They're taking it back. They will not curse you. <laughs> or if you're talking, with, get, get a chance to talk to somebody at, at the checkout. Of course, this is rather annoying to the people behind you, but if you actually go through the person checkout and, and you say, I... I Thank you that you're. I can talk to a real person here rather than one of those AI machines down there that, that want to accuse me of shoplifting. Uh, and just compliment them and smile, you know, just, and then, you know, as, as Paul says, let your speech be seasoned with salt. So that you, the conversation just sort of gently ease it toward God or bring their attention toward God. Uh, say something about the weather or something and, and see how they react. And then let the Holy Spirit guide you. Just let the Holy Spirit guide you. You know, Let him do what he wants to do with you. Let, you have to let him, because he is the light in us, let him be the light. Don't hide your light. Use the influence we have as the light. Be the light on the web. Be the light on, on social media. And do the thumbs up and thumbs down. I mean, verbally. Explain it. It's a little hard to do on Twitter unless you get premium, I guess. You know, that 250 characters or whatever it is is not enough. That's not a paragraph. But we have to confront people with these things. It's like Franklin Graham, you know, when, when the Israelis give him the little tour over, he's being used. And Christians are so dumb. We are so dumb. That that we think they can lead us around like by the nose, and we think they're they're helping us. They're they're just being good, and because he has got his own personal interests in getting access, well, they're not giving him access to Gaza. They're not giving anybody access to Gaza. You know, the, I saw the UN was boasting about how many tons of stuff they brought into Gaza, and I commented on that and said. There's 200, there are 2 million people there. That's a drop in the bucket. Nothing to boast about. It's just, we have to be the light. And you know, we need to rebuke people, public officials, for not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Like the UN. Rebuke. Rebuke them. Rebuke the, the head of the UN for, for, what did I tell him? I told him to be a man. Because <laughs> they don't. They're, they're a bunch of weasels. They're a bunch of cowards. They're, they're concerned about their own jobs and their own positions, and they don't want to get uh, um, in trouble with the United States. Said, we got a problem. We got a, the United States has become an evil empire, and we need to expose that, and we need to, we need to demand Christians, we're two-thirds of the population. If we demand 
that there be some reforms and we close down all those foreign bases and stop spending trillions of dollars on useless garbage that only kills people. That's not defense. Aircraft carriers are not defensive weapons. They're offensive weapons. Stealth bombers are not defensive weapons. They're offensive weapons. We need to stop putting up with this nonsense. Stop putting up with it. The whole stop believing the lies. Stop allowing them to build the military industrial congressional complex. It's got to be torn down. The money money has to be stripped out of the political process. We do need some real reforms. Because this country has been corrupted and the government no longer serves the interests of the American people. They're supposed to be our servants. The president is supposed to be our servant, not our master. We should fire these bums. Not allow them to get away with their nonsense. They come out and give their, their speeches, hold their feet to the fire. Treat, they're supposed to be our servants. Discipline them. Take their money away. It's like churches. Pastor's teaching garbage. He's not preaching Christ and Christ crucified. He's not showing people what they're supposed to be doing. He's not functioning as he should. Well, no money for you. So he gives a bad sermon. No offering that week. He'll get the message. Half the con congregation, the offering falls by 50% for a week. What did I say? He'll start asking questions. What did I do? What did I do? Hold him to account. He's supposed to be our servant, not our master. Churches should always be congregational. You can do this in Catholic Church, too. Use your pocketbook. Discipline the Pope. And tell your church board no money for Peter until he behaves himself. What are they going to do? They don't have power over you. Go to the priest and say, we pay your salary. You're going to give us communion regardless. You, you, we are your employers. You serve us and the Lord Jesus. You don't serve that silly man in the Vatican. And if you're immoral, you better resign. If you're living a homosexual lifestyle, you're not a Christian you have no business being a Christian priest. You better resign. Repent. Get saved. We can deal with these people. It's the same thing with everything. It's like the, the Lutheran church that I was looking at here. There's an awful lot I agree with them about. But their sectarianism is a huge obstacle. If... if if a new believer cannot come to the table of the Lord because of silly rules and the fact that you have to go through a two-year course or something, like, there is something wrong with you. That's a serious error. It's the Lord's table. It's not your table. Don't give me any nonsense about you trying to protect people from handling it. You know, that's five minutes of instruction. That's a bunch of trash. People, churches trying to, and the identity thing, trying to hold on to an identity. Well, our ancestors were all Lutheran Germans or Lutheran Norwegians or whatever. When you come to Christ, your identity gets crucified. You cannot follow Jesus and hold on to your identity. Because your identity is sinful. To try to hold on to that is sinfulness. You have to take up your cross daily. Die to that. Die to your skin color. Die to all this garbage that the world is promoting and be the light of Christ. We need to take individual responsibility for being the light of Christ in this world, if you call yourself a Christian. 
And that includes disciplining others, instructing others, exposing others, rewarding others for what's right and what's wrong. Especially on the internet, but in public life. Politically? No, you don't reward people who are militantly evil like Biden. And you don't accept candidates that are e egotistical maniacs and it's all about them. We need to demand decent candidates or simply we won't ref we refuse to vote for this trash that you keep putting up to us. Shame them. Shame the of all people, the easiest to shame are the progressives. Well, and the conservatives. So you're not conserving what is good. You're in the you're in the pockets of your masters. Expose them. Expose them with the truth. Shame them with the truth. Call them to do what is good, the good of what they're supposed to represent. Again, the conservatives conserving good, the progressives moving away from what is evil to what is good. The goal for both is good. I hope if it's not, they have no purpose as being public servants. And anybody that tries to be a master or a demagogue, out the door. Because in the United States, the people are the masters, not the servants. We're not under a king. They are simply servants of the population. And we should make sure they understand that. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven.